Anyway, welcome and good to see you all. I, I'm, I'm not sure if Oksana is going to come. Ilse is on her way. She said she was going to be about 10 minutes late. So everybody doing okay? Have a good week? Yeah. Having a good week? As you know, my week is like really flying with so many things going on. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I, I think that... A, I bought a house and sold an apartment. <laughs> oh, that's true. Right yeah, on. that's a lot. Those are two major, yeah. major things. Ian May is I give really this to you now, so oh, I don't yeah. forget. Thank you. Great. Ian is a newbie here too, right? Mm -hmm. Ian came from uh, the West Coast, Silicon mm -hmm. Valley. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people are coming and going, huh? That's yeah. the nature of the human experience. We come <laughs> and then we go, and it ha and it happens fast. <laughs> Walter uh, Becker passed this week. I know. Walter I Becker of Steely uh, Dan. I actually talked to you about that. But yeah. I was surprised. Uh, that, uh, in particular, for what reason? I don't know. There, something about those guys, I always think of them as like, oh, those will, be, those will be like old jazz guys. You know, they'll be in their 80s and 90s, you know, still like. Not about. quite. They're more my generation. Yeah. Walter no, but was I mean, they will be. I mean, that's why in my mind I thought, well, there'll be like a lot of those jazz guys just keep going and going and going. They've yeah. got so much output, you know. They do, yeah. I mean, I don't know what happened. They didn't disclose any information, uh, you know, uh, about it. Well, so, you know, people come, check in, and we all check in about the same time, right? We're all infants, you know, nine months in the womb, and then is the way it seems to go. As far as I know, nobody comes in any other way. Um, and uh, But the exit strategy is very different. Some people go very, very early on. Some people yes. stretch it out. It's a interesting process because longer is not necessarily better you know more time isn't necessarily better more time is just more time so and at any given point you could just be done with it you could have en have enough you know it's been great I had a good time you know I I got it you know the human thing yeah I I got it, I did it, and uh, I'm grateful for all of it, much of it, you know, that we continue to gestate and, and uh, come to understand in deeper and more expansive ways, and then in a flash we're out of the experience again. It's really wild. <laughs> And then the process of as you get on in years, I'm 60, I'm 68 as far as uh, years uh, is uh, refers to. And I can just tell you that as time goes on in my experience, I'm sure you see it as well in your own experience, family members start going, mothers, fathers, uncles, siblings. If you stay long enough, every, you know, your friends, everybody, every, you're, they're all, they all seem to flash out, you know, and they're not here anymore. But... Um, I guess I have a somewhat related question. Sure. That, you know, I don't know, there's, you know, at least so far in my life, there's been a lot of struggle, new problems, you know, I overcome some obstacle and then some new obstacle keeps coming out. And then part of me thinks, oh, at some point I'll reach a point and then everything will be calm and then it'll be fine. Um, but... In practice, I don't think that happens. Even in retirement, there's, you know, struggles and... Uh, no you know. question about that. The inside the world experience is, uh, you know, that process of always something. Mm -hmm. Something is happening or comes up or you have to, you know, you got to wake up, you got to go to sleep, you got to go to work, you know, you got to brush your teeth. There's always something to be done. You, you have to go shopping. Um, but that moment of ascendant opportunity, peace, 
attaining peace is a vertical experience, not an inside the world experience, right? Mm -hmm. So that moment and that opportunity is always available to you, but you have to return to your, the fundamental principle, the fundamental reality of who you are beyond the thinking associated with who you think you are and where you think you are. That stuff is all helter skelter, right? It's all up and down, it's more or less. Um, but the opportunity to rise above that, which I'm referring to in, in terms of the idea of ascending, an ascendant experience, a vertical experience, a shift is not time-oriented and it's not space-oriented. It's no way contingent upon anything changing in my human experience or being different at all. It's the thought or the thoughtful recognition that my reality is beyond my humanity. And all the thinking by which I determine or think myself to be here. Right? The 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 principle, fundamental creative thought that I share with God is none of this. It's, it's none of that conceptual based on concepts of separation and limitation. It's none of that. It's that experience that's beyond all that, which is always available. So, you know, when people learn how to meditate, they start off thinking, oh, you know, oh, I got to remember my mantra, and then remembering the mantra seems to be, uh, it takes precedence, and then you're not so driven or caught up in all that worldly stuff that you think you have to do. Um, but then most people who meditate long enough, they discover that, you know, pretty much any time and every time that they meditate, their mind is wandering. And you know, going to a variety of thoughts and attempting to escape the simplicity of being without thought. Just being here, being alive, being. And then in the advanced stages of meditation, you learn how to observe your mind going here and there. And that's not a problem because you know and are now having a relationship, a sense of being beyond where my mind goes. So you're meditating and your mind's over here and then it's rushing over here, but you're over here. You're awake and still in the midst of the storm of all that activity. You learn how to recognize that sense of yourself that's just awake. It's not thinking in terms of worldly stuff, conceptual stuff, time, space oriented, human, personality, identity stuff, highest, right? You're not you're not thinking in terms of that. And so it welcome. Thank you. <laughs> you can sit here or over there. Those pillars are movable. You can, move the pillows. I can turn the fan up if anybody wants more air on them. So, so you know, you're, for as, it seems to me, not that I know, but it seems to me that to have a worldly experience, your mind has to be actively generating it. It has to be involved in this, this stuff of the world. So in order to remain in the world, and in order to remain in the separate self-personality, I have to be making that up. And that's what all that stuff is that I'm thinking of all the time. If I wasn't thinking of all that Jeffrey-related stuff, it would be gone. I wouldn't, that part of my mental activity would just be an open vessel. So, um, and some people think that's the goal, but I haven't met anybody that ever attained it. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can get really good at meditating 
and having that transcendent or ascendant experience beyond the activity of the worldly mind, and that's available to everyone. And you can you can develop that, and that's just really awareness, present awareness, situational awareness, but not situational in terms of worldly stuff. It's situational in terms of being stuff, right? Because before you think of another thought of anything having to do with your Ian life, your being the first active thought that's an influence is the, is the fact of your being alive. You're just being. And you can zone into that and tap into that anytime you want to. And that's the gateway to heaven. That's the portal to peace, the peace of God. That's where God is. That's where Holy Spirit is. That's where everything comes from and where everything returns to. And that isn't a place or a time. It's right here, right now. You, allow, you permit it to speak to you. You permit it to speak through you, for you. You learn to pay attention to it, to give your attention to it, to listen to it, to feel it, to hear it. Even though your mind is going to, you know, likely race around and wander around. But you can be actively present even when your mind is doing its thing. Because that presence of your true self, of your re reality, is always on. It's always here. It's occurring before you think of all those distractions. Before you get caught up in that distraction called the worldly dream, the worldly illusion. Is it a matter of interest, do you think, mostly? Well... You could definitely say that the case could be made for that is your mind goes where your attention, I guess you could say, goes where and your mind goes wherever you will it to be. Yeah. So you learn how to be mindful. Often that idea is used, the idea of being mindful or truly thoughtful, which is just simply being present and open, paying attention, observing aware of your thoughts, but not caught up in them necessarily. Would you say in your experience that the situations you deal with in your Jeffrey experience, maybe in the past you were interested mostly in the experience and, and how to deal with things, the experience, and now you're more interested in how you are while you're in the experience? Absolutely, because where else can I go? Well, that's for me. That seems to be where the interest keeps going. It's like I'm dealing with some things with finances, and it's like whenever it comes up, I'm interested in the result, but I keep noticing how I'm, I'm more interested in like how I am as I'm dealing with the issues. Well, yeah, because I mean, it's it's your only it's the only sane move you have. Yeah, because I you know it, the issue is going to get dealt with one way or the other, but I want to be at peace first. Well, then, then you will be. <laughs> then you will be because that's your will. Yeah. Because you're recognizing that I have an option in the middle of all this, this what seems to be a sea of choices that I have to deal with and make, decisions I have to make, stuff I have to do. There's one alternative. There's one answer to it, and that's what you're describing now. It's the idea of being awake aware of my thoughts, not being driven by them, not being identified with them, which means I can, I can think of the bill that I have to pay and I can decide on a time when I'm going to pay it, but I don't have to fuss about it now if I'm not going to deal with it now. I have the right to just be here in the midst of the of the idea that I have to deal with that and trust that I will deal with that when it's time comes and it's okay not to deal with that right now. So that I can do what it is that I'm giving priority to. What I'm giving priority to is this. Or as you would describe, first and foremost, being present, being at peace. Because peace is all I want. See, if peace is all you want, then peace is all you're ever going to have. 
It's amazing when you make that decision how much you notice the pressures you put on yourself. Almost constantly. You're doing it to yourself? <laughs> Always. There isn't a th single thing that happens to you that you're not culpable. Mm -hmm. you're, that you're not responsible for. You're not certainly not to blame, you're not at fault, and you're not guilty. But you are the cause of whatever that is. No matter where it seems to be happening. I'm, you know, the cause of Donald Trump as president. Even though, I, in my mind, I have certainty I didn't vote for him. But it doesn't matter. You know, it, it doesn't matter. He, I'm responsible for the experience I'm, I'm having of that. Just like I'm responsible for the experience of having that I'm having of everything else. And that allows me, that empowers me to, to re be at rest in the midst of all that without fumbling around and getting caught up in the messiness of it and how it could happen and why is it happening. It, it, you know, why does it enter into it? It is happening. I'm responsible for it. What's the, how can I be helpful? What's the best I can do now so that if I'm having a problem with something, I'm now seeing the opportunity for me to be the solution to that in some way in the circumstance that I'm in, right? As Jesus says, if you learn how to provide the answer, the thing that seems to be missing in any and all worldly situations, which is peace or love, then you'll never be without peace or love because you will only have what you're expressing, what you're giving, what you're bringing, what you're offering. So, so it is really simple. So, you know, in one of the workbook lessons, all I want is the peace of God. Right? All I want is the peace of God getting clear that the idea that I could, because in our twisted thinking, we would think, well, that I can have peace once I pay that bill. Or I can have peace once I get my house sold. Or I can have peace once I get the apartment done. It, no, that's just very messy and confused thinking, and it's not going to pay off. It's, it's, it's a distraction. It will never end. Too. It, well... It ends in the sense of me realizing that it never began. No, I mean the situations that you have to deal with that you keep saying, well, eventually I'll get there. There is no eventually I'll get there. Well, unless there is, right? Because I don't, right? Unless there is, because I don't know. I don't know. That one thing I'm clear about is I don't know. So I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know what could happen. Sure. I don't know if a situation can manifest itself in which none of that seems to be. In fact, all my learning and all of you know my experience seems to suggest that things keep changing and evolving and evolving and that ultimately, no matter how impossible it may seem in the dream of separation, that inevitably we reach a state and a stage where not where everything has changed and things are no longer the way I thought them to be right you know eventually that could happen in terms of a collective aspect of the dream of separation where it just becomes more reflective of a higher level or a higher vibrational experience everything becomes more reflective of the active principle of God's presence, peace and love, where it's not, you know, it's not so, doesn't seem so scarce, where you go to the grocery store and somebody at the checkout counter is expressing it in some unique and wonderful way all their own. And, you know, then you go to the bank and somebody the, somebody at the bank is expressing it. Or you're expressing it when you buy the newspaper at the newsstand in the, in the street. So everything begins to take on this quality of a more desirable experience. 
Now, when is that going to happen? Whenever I just, I'm okay with that happening. Be, be, because it's already happening. See, this principle of, called reality is always happening. The only question is, is whether you're in on it or not, whether you're seeing it. The question is not when is Jesus going to come, when is Christ going to come. It's am, am I willing to see that he's here now so that I can have that experience when I'm with you so that I can see the reality of that second coming in my experience of being with yourself and sharing that experience in a way we, where we can all be comforted by it and have a visceral felt experience of it where we just seem to loosen up and lighten up and feel more relaxed and at home in what is so right now freeing ourselves from the distracting, you know, uh, unessential aspects of our human experience. Because none of that really matters. Right? Jesus says, if you're ready and willing, I'll manage everything in your life for you. This is higher mind, Christ mind, universal mind, the mind you share with God, Holy Spirit mind, saying to you, look, if you're willing, I'll take care of all that difficult stuff that you think is difficult. I'll take care of it. He says, I'll take care of, I'll do for you all the things that don't really matter. While guiding you, guiding you in everything that matters absolutely. So that all the details of when you're working out or when you're writing that check or when you're doing groceries shopping or whether you know, you're getting up in the morning at the right time so you can be at work at the, on time and all of that, you're just, all that stuff is just happening and unfolding naturally because you're not making, you're not grandstanding against it. You want that to happen. You want everything to be easy and you recognize that you need that universal mind, Holy Spiritizing mind to be with you always so that all those details are always being administered to. Right? So, you know, you can you can be on be in on the goods, be in the sweet spot, be in the world but not of the world. Having this beyond it all experience even while you seem to be in the middle of all the details of what appears to be the same. Well, what gets in the way? Is it not trusting that it'll work out? Or sure. It, it's not, it's ye, ye who have little faith. <laughs> well, what's the aspect that has, that doesn't know what faith is? What is that aspect? It's ego. It's ego. Yeah, it's my person. It's my Jeffrey self. It's all the stuff that I learn, right? All the psychic, mental, emotional, behavioral muscle, gristle that I built, that I think myself to have built up over a lifetime, that's going to work automatically until I choose again. It's going to keep on doing my life for me or to me until I opt out of it. And the opting out of it is to recognize that I am not that. And I no longer want to be at the effect of all of that. Now that's different than saying I want to change all of that because trying to, you know, to change, change changing things is really difficult because the instant you think you need to change it, you, the, the instant you think that thought, you just made it again. <laughs> you know, you just made the thing you think you need to change. You follow what I'm saying? The instant I don't want to do that, the instant I say, I don't want to say that, I don't want to do that, I already did it up here. I know, I curse in the car a lot. That's okay. You know. And words are words. <laughs> and I always say, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry. Yeah, you think, but you, see, you got to understand that you got to give yourself permission. The way out of that is stop trying to correct that ridiculous, you know, words are words. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know what the Tourette's is, you know. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like people try to hold back something so much that they just you can't. keep the more you hold it back, the more of it there is to hold back. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> the very famous uh, Indian uh, sage, Sai uh, Bhagwan. Nichananda. Uh, Bhagwan. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it does. Beyond Ananda. Beyond Ananda. Rajneesh. He did a... uh, Osho. 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 Yeah. Osho did did this incredible talk. It's about a 20-minute talk, 15-minute, 10-minute talk on four-letter words. It's hilarious. It's hysterical. Because, you know, he would have this question and answer period with his disciples, with his followers... And invariably, somebody would say, "Oh, I, you know, I love you so much. I adore your teaching. I get so much value out. I just wish you would stop using four-letter words, because apparently he was famous for using four-letter words." And so he just went off on <laughs> using four-letter words because, you know, the way to the way to get over it is get is get over it. It's not the words that's the problem. It's the idea that there's something wrong that's the problem. As long as you're rooted in the idea that there's something wrong, then there's always going to be a wrong something, right? That's the fundamental problem of why we can't seem to get around or get outside or get above the idea of evil in the world, right? Because we don't recognize that aspect of our own thinking wherein we're unconsciously or consciously against ourselves. Out of which then we have to be, we have to stand against something or someone else. Right? Does that make sense? You know, so, so lightening up is really getting outside of all that controversy that doesn't really exist. Doesn't really exist. It's unreal. Learning to laugh, to be present, to have happiness, to be happy to share in the abundance of joy, of God, God's joy, which is a present experience. It's, it's visceral, it's real. You can have as much of that as you want, any time of day. You just have to want it. You have to be clear you want it, above all other things, no matter what your mind seems to prefer or tend towards being biased to. In the company of, when you're feeling, you know, you're actually have, when I'm actually having the experience of joy, and I'm around a situation with people who just will not break, they won't be joyish no matter what. Um, it's kind of a, a tricky kind of feeling. I mean, I still feel my joy, but I feel a sadness too that it's not shared. Well, how do you know it's not shared? I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it, it if you look through your eyes and you try, you're already in the thought that can't recognize universal joy. The fundamental truth in which all things are perfectly content and at rest and joyful, natural. Joyful is just a, an idea of your natural energy. Your natural radiant creative energy is, is unlimited joy. Now, the ego doesn't know anything about that. But you can know that because it's, it has everything to do with what you are and who you are. It's already available in you. So when you think in terms of the idea that it's scarce or not here, then you already decided against it. And you can't, you're no longer speaking to it or from it. So you can be perfectly joyful and expand and experience that shared interactive experience of joy, whether they're laughing or not. You can have a good time. Okay, that's good. All right. Then. Yeah, and what that does is that honors a deeper, more fundamental principle in, in who is me, yeah. where that joy is active and known, not a mystery at all, not not a question, not in doubt. And that's the best way to really share that experience because under the influence of that kind of thing, generally the whole 
vibe and feeling just loosens up. And, you know, then you start seeing signs of cracks and smiles and, you know, every now and then a chuckle or a laugh. You can see that people start actually breathing and relaxing beyond all that stereotypic tenseness and nervousness. Because, it, it, you know, that's here all the time. That's active. Everybody, every living thing is in on it. And through your willingness to accept it, to understand that, to accept it and honor the reality of it, and therefore to have faith in it, it becomes more accessible to you, more known to you, more observable. Because once, when your mind is actively, when your mind has actively decided that it's not here, it's, it, yeah, it can't see it, you know. So your mind has to be open in order to really... And it's judgment, too. And it's a judgment, too. I'm well, sure. that's what... Yeah, that's and what... Then, when then you're, when that, ju decisions judgment. are judgment, are, are judgments. That's exactly. Yeah. And I don't want to go there. Well, that's wise and understandable. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Yeah. That's kind of like what Kevin was saying when he said, all I want is peace. Yeah. So... You know, my mind is over here and over there, but all I want is peace, and I'm just going to stay with the peace, mm -hmm. while my mind goes seems to go over here and over there. And learning how to ride isn't that what a surf surfer does? Isn't that what a great musician does? Isn't that what anybody who's dancing. really dancing in life mm -hmm. is really doing? Yeah. You know, their life is like. And they're just dancing above it all. You know, they're having an experience of beyond all that, an experience of grace, of, of aliveness, even in the midst of this, that, and the other thing, which I need not worry about because he'll take care of it. He being singular self, universal self, infinite creative self, that's miraculous in ability and can do anything, anytime, anywhere, retroactively, progressively, and certainly presently. So, you know, the sweet spot, the moment of truth, the moment of infinite opportunity is always in the right here, right now. The only question, as, I've, as I often said, is, are you in on it? Do you want in on it? Do you want in on it? Yeah. Yeah. That's you, all you, you look like you have wings behind you. Well, it's a reflection of your wingedness <laughs> right. and your willingness to see it, right? It's that, that kind of thing. But, you know, that's, that's always the question. Do I want in on it? Yes. Do I, am I willing to be alive now? Am I willing to enter into conscious presence of what I am and who I am already? Am I, willing, am I willing to step out of my thoughts, out of my head, out of my distractedness, out of my mind wandering? That doesn't require my mind wandering to stop. You know, I'm not my mind wandering, right? That's what we learn when these are just thoughts I'm thinking. <laughs> you have, and then the principle that you rule your mind. You have to, you decide what your mind is going to be and what it's going to stand for at any given moment. What the Course attempts is to raise up the prominence in your own awareness something uniquely and wonderfully different than ho-hum business as usual within the human experience which is all controversy, stress, distractedness, delusion, deludedness. <laughs> Do I want peace? Do I want peace? Yes. When do I want it? I want it now. Always. Yeah. Am I willing to permit the radiant fundamental shining aspect of God's radiant presence to enter into my awareness? Absolutely. I'd be a fool not to. Can you stop that? Can you what? Ever? Can you stop you allow what? that radiance to come in? I mean, you can you, can stop, you stop allowing it? it? Yeah. Well, can you? How? If God is, is that eternal, infinite, radiant presence, which is everywhere and always, 
which created me forever a part of his everywhere and alwaysness, in which there is no opposite and no alternative, the idea or the principle of stopping it, does that even have any sense to it? Well, what I mean is, is it, is it stoppable? It's not stoppable. It's well, never stoppable. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah uh, this course does not aim to teach the meaning of love, for that is impossible. Right? It's, it's beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at um, removing, the blocks. removing the blocks to the awareness of love, thank you, of love's presence, which not only can happen, must happen. Uh, the opposite of love is fear, but what can have no opposite? But love, which God created, has no opposite. What is all-encompassing, who is God Almighty, and His peace, His attributes, is everywhere always. It's beyond oppositions, beyond opposites. What is all-encompassing, my Father's will is all-encompassing. I am forever enfolded in His will. Right? That's all the stuff that Jesus was talking about when He said, I am the way. God is the way. God shares the way with me because that's what life is. It's way. <laughs> I am the truth. I am the light because there is nothing other than that. This is the fundamental, unalterable reality that you share with Creator and which you are co-creating along with Him. Do you want to be in on that? I have no choice. That's true, but you can make the idea that I have no choice an issue, or it can be a wonderful, miraculous, wonderful idea, miraculous idea, which frees you from the idea or the conflict associated with the idea that that can be stopped, or that has an alternative. Yeah, I was, I was actually making a joke of that. No, no, that's fine. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, right. I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to use everything. No, I, I love it because you, you really, I mean, I could just pack up now and leave from what I already got tonight. I mean, it's just amazing. That, yeah, and that's, and that's, look, mm -hmm. none of this is necessary. And Holy Spirit is always offering you a very personal version of that, of this. You, you're being, your salvation come. So your salvation isn't coming in the sense of time. It, it'll come in that sense if you insist on delaying, on not receiving it now. But that is being given you always because that's what the gift of God is. God is giving you all that always. That's what His self is. That's what His reality is. That's what, and prayer being the means to remember it. So that prayer doesn't, it, it, as I move up in my own being awake, prayer becomes more encompassing, right? So that, you know, the minute I wake up in the morning and my mind seems to be going, I'm re in the recognition that I'm praying. And I'm always getting the result of what I'm praying for. So I want to be clear about what I'm praying for. So that I more and more often I'm, and than not, I'm having the experience of being, being in holy communion. I'm hearing God's voice. I'm, I'm hearing it in all things. Continually. So that all the meaning I've given things is no longer the meaning that things have. So that everything can become what it is which far surpasses my thought or thinking about what it is. So I can be free of the distorting, limiting influences of my own worldly thinking, my own illusory thought system. See, before the idea that 
this is an illusion, these are illusory thoughts, is reality. Before all that, you know, God is creating. And you're the effect or the result of his creation. It puts you right in, right on the throne, right on the altar of God, along with him, forever along with him. Before we turned our back or separated or became, seemed to seemed to separate the um, experience between God and His Son, the creation was one of just continued of not just but continuous love. So when when I hear that He is continuously creating. I'm wondering, you know, what, you mean, what does that mean? Does it mean that we're continuously experiencing love? Is that what if that means? Well, because he's not what is God's will for you? To love, to love myself and to love one another, and, you know. Let there be love. Let there be light. Let love, yeah. If God's will is let there be love, then what's the effect of that? What's the result of that? Love. Yeah. Yeah. So, is there any question about that? I'm just wondering. <laughs> because here's the wonder, okay? The wonder is, I don't understand why we went down this dark alley if we stayed okay. in the... Yeah, know, I get it. You don't understand. The connection of... What know, dark alley? The imaginary one. The illu- <laughs> well, why? I mean, is that... Do you really want to have a discussion about the imaginary one of which your version is different than mine and you know I mean what where are we going with that I mean how effective and useful is it going to be to talk about what didn't happen it's hard to call it dreaming right it's the way they keep referring to the dream it's all dreaming it's not real yeah you know should we share dreams or share reality what do you think would be more effective reality of course okay so then 99% of the questions that I think and ask are really just distracting me from what's already happening, which I'm in on, and which would do a far better job of informing me than getting caught up in sidebar questions about what didn't happen, that I think may have happened. Because, you know, it seems to me in my perceivable realm that it did, did happen. So why do we have to stay here then? Who said you had to stay here? Who, who says you have to stay here? Who says you were at, there was ever a here that you Yourself? had to stay in? The ego? Well, whose thought is it? Your own? Okay. Yeah, it seems to be a thought I'm thinking. Right. We're, trying to, we're trying to solve a problem which actually doesn't exist. Exactly. So, do you see how these questions just take you back into a conversation that you're, you're pretty weary of having? You've been having it a long time in a variety of different forms with different people. How effective has it been? Has it given, has it been helpful to you? Does it no. give you... Okay, do you want to continue then? No, I don't in the uncertainty and doubt and the anxiety associated with not knowing, or would you rather be in on the no? I'd be in on the no, but I just want to get, come this, you know, beyond the beyond. Well, with the beyond. where would that be and when would that be? <laughs> right now. Yeah. So then my only need would be to pay attention to it and to stop doubting it even when my mind seems to doubt it and I, it seems to be necessary to form another question about it. In the course it says that the only way of undoing is to ask the question. What's that? To ask a que- the asking of questions is a way to, un- to the undoing. Well, question can, the idea of the concept of question can be useful if you're asking the right question. And if you're asking the aspect of your reality for the answer, not getting caught up in the questioning of the questioning doubtful self, which is all rooted in illusion, illusion being what never happened and what doesn't really exist, because God didn't create doubt. 
God didn't create the system out of which fear seems to be possible. God didn't create the system out of which not knowing, being ignorant of that which I am, could be possible. Ilsa. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's all right. You know, I didn't know if you were sleeping or... No, I just get really relaxed in these conversations. Okay. So... <laughs> I close my eyes. But, um... I'll <laughs> yeah, I don't want you to miss out on it. Not no, that you could not either. that you couldn't miss out on <laughs> right. it. So, you know, I might tap you on your shoulder, you. so to speak, and say, you know, stay with it. So um, if I think doubt and fear and confusion is wrong, then I'm not seeing that love encompasses all of that. I mean doubt and fear and confusion can guide me. It encompasses it encompasses it in a way so that it doesn't exist. That's what I, I mean. Yeah. You, you can use that as an aspect of love to, to reflect, oh, I'm, I'm in doubt. Like, what's there to be a doubt about? I mean, you can use those feelings. I think that the, we keep trying to figure out how to... Make them stop. Yes. You know, the better... Instead of using them as just tools. That they don't... Or recognizing that they don't really exist. Yeah which permits you to be in the here and now, in the right. holy here and now. It gives you the right to enter in and to be present in the name of yourself, for yourself. And believe you me, that's your only need is to remember yourself, is to receive yourself. And all receiving of thyself is to recognize thyself because yourself is already here. It can't go anywhere in the same sense that God doesn't come and go. He's always been with you. Do I want to be in on the knowledge of that, in on the experience of it? Absolutely. Or would I rather chase my fantasy and get, get caught up in that system of turning away, denying, resisting, reiterating, reaffirming false ideas. False ideas are not a problem unless I continue to assert them, introduce them, impose them on myself. Solve them. Try to solve them. All of that. Or except allow God's answer to them to be, which is His Word. The fundamental self uh, expression of his self reality entering in to form in whatever form it enters into. So, whatever the idea uh, is becomes a valid exchange of reality in place of what seemed to be before. So that holiness can be an awareness instead of being overcome or driven out by that doubting Thomas mentality. The not wanting to know it, and what about this, and what about that, and how about this, and what about this thing, and that thing, and, and here, you know, all questions are really the same. Now, mind you, I love questions, but they don't answer anything. Although, you know, we we do deal, we do receive qu questions or opportunities as well. But the, all I need do is what? Is listen. I need only listen. I need only be open and receptive. There's nothing mysterious going on here that I need to figure out or that, you know, God's answer will manifest itself. It'll present itself. It will enter in in the perfect form for me if I don't speak over it. <laughs> if I don't overrule it and get caught up in thinking that, wait a minute, that, that's not the answer. You know, that's not the answer. What about this? You know. Anyway, let's read a little bit. We'll pick up where we left off which is uh, in, this, in the book we've been reading, this Song of Prayer. 
Did, is that notated in such a way that I can find the paragraph, or is it just like a? I'm a not sure that's available in. It's online. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it is. It's. It's. Uh, Anybody wants to look it up, just look for the song of prayer, and it comes up in the PDF. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Great. I'm trying to see where did we? We can look song song of prayer PDF. It comes right up. Okay. Did we did we read praying with others, or did we stop right there? I think were the shadows or the echoes of what was the be what was being with the highest, and, and then having the echoes of it. Do you go for the echoes around it, or do you stay with the highest? Right. I'm just. I think I remember that. Sorry. Good But it's very small. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yes, oh, I'm, ne I'm never gonna see that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's too small. I don't think we got to the. To the I, mean, I don't. I don't think we even got to the ladder. Yeah. Of prayer. I think that's. Maybe that's where we ended. I'm not sure. Because I think. Okay. All right. So we'll we'll read there. It it'll all it'll all you know. Yeah, I don't think we read the letter of prayer. Okay, perfect. Prayer is no beginning and no end. You're always praying. It is a part of life, it, but it does but it does change in form and grow with learning until it reaches form until it reaches its formless state and fuses into total communication with God. In its asking form, it need not and often does not make appeal to God or even involve belief in Him. At these levels, prayer is merely wanting out of a sense of scarcity and lack. And whenever you're operating out of a sense of scarcity and lack, you're not communicating to Holy Spirit because Holy Spirit is beyond scarcity and lack. So, you know. Yeah. These forms of prayer, nothing wrong with them, by the way, but, you know, we need to really understand what they are. These forms of prayer are asking out of a sense of need, out of a sense of scarcity and lack, always involve feelings of weakness and inadequacy, which ego, personality self, is the author of. God created infinite power, which is the fundamental principle of all creation. You have it, that power. These forms of prayer are asking out of need always involve feelings of weakness and inadequacy and could never be made by a son of God who knows who he is. No one then who is sure of his identity, and identity, capital I, is the only thing you can be sure of. Everything in the realm of ego, all lesser are other identifications, ego-sponsored identifications, You'll, you can never be sure of any of them. They're all riddled and, and uh, manifestations of denial, ignorance of self. Hence, they're all doubtful because they're all illusory-based. You have to opt out of that. What am I? Who am I? No one then who is sure of, of his, uh, his self, his identity, her identity, same thing, his or her, could pray in these forms if you were sure of yourself. It's only when you're misled by your own egotistical self-conceptual separate self-identity, separate self-concept thinking where you would form questions or prayers that were reflective of that kind of need, that kind of doubt, which you could never really have. No one then who is sure of his identity, the truth of who I am, could pray in these forms. 
Yet it is also true that no one who is uncertain of his identity can avoid praying in this way. Now, in no, in, in no uncertain terms, of course, it's not saying there's anything wrong with praying for, out of a sense of want, lack, or scarcity. It's just shining the light on these unique differences that are important for me to understand. So it is also true that no one who is uncertain of his identity can avoid praying in this way. In other words, when I'm thinking of myself as a separate, weak, inadequate, limited self, I'm in need, and my thinking is going to reflect that. Hence, my praying is going to reflect that. And prayer is as continual as life. It's always happening, right? The mind is always active. The mind is always getting what it's asking for. So you have to be clear. I have to be clear about what I want. Everyone prays without ceasing, without ceasing. I'm always praying. Ask and you have received, for you have established what it is you want. It is also possible now, it is also possible to reach a higher form of asking out of need. So asking, but out of a sense of need, beyond the sense of need. For in this world, prayer is reparative. In the world of the ego, in the world of the dreaming self, of the illusory separate self, prayer is reparative. You know, I'm attempting to fill a void, a lack, a sense of inadequacy and weakness, a sense of pain, of fear, of loneliness. So it is, it is also possible to reach a higher form of asking out or beyond need, for in this world prayer is reparative and so it must entail levels of learning. I'm learning. Here the asking may be addressed to God in honest belief, though not yet with understanding. A vague and usually unstable sense of identification has generally been reached but tends to be blurred by a deep-rooted sense of sin, guilt, wrongness. It is possible at this level to continue to ask for things of this world in various forms. And it is also possible to ask for gifts, such as honesty or goodness, and particularly for forgiveness. For the many sources of guilt that inevitably, inevitably underlie any prayer of need. In other words, all neediness, needful prayer, is predicated on the sense of guilt, wrongness. Or I couldn't possibly perceive myself as having a need. Now, can we go back a little bit? Just kind of the idea of prayer kind of I got the feeling that you're praying all the time not just when you're holding your hands together absolutely and yes so like, and I'm sitting here like you know a slice of pizza would be good right now that's a prayer of, in a way it, it is it is it, it is because it represents some want on in, in my thinking some idea that my mind is forming that out of which it energy is being focused and things are going to manifest. It's an organizing principle. Every thought is an organizing principle. It's going to gather in thinking, feeling, and behavioral action-oriented stuff that's going, to make, that's going to manifest itself. And maybe me eating a piece of pizza or overruling it and not eating it, having a salad or something. Did, did that answer your question? So it's, it? Yeah, it's just kind of funny that, you know, growing up, they were like, oh, you know, you're, you have to pray and you have to do it a specific way or it doesn't count. Yeah, you know? no, it's all, you know, it's just, <laughs> prayer is the active principle of thought of your mind, of, of your mind's function. Mm -hmm. It's always, uh, it's always working. It's always it on. A, we call it thinking, but Jesus calls it praying. Is that, so to speak? Well, yeah, I mean, 
you know, um, what th this idea then is bringing light to the fact that the mind is always active. I need to realize that so that I can see, you know, for instance, if for five minutes during the day, I think all I want is the peace of God. All I want is the peace of God. Okay, five minutes is over. And then, oh, that son of a bitch, Trump. <laughs> oh, that, you know, I can't believe, you know, my neighbor, how rude. Or, you know, whoa, yeah. the, my contractor, you know. Right? That's what you're asking for. Yeah, so all day long I'm raging along, mm -hmm. along my world, the dynamics of my worldly upset. And then wondering why, yeah, this Course in Miracles stuff doesn't work, you know. I did my lesson, I've been doing my lessons. You know, so this idea that we're sharing is bringing light to the fact that the mind is always praying. <laughs> right? So I need to understand that so that I can overcome this habitual inertia of my controversial or conflicted mind, my, my tendency to deceive myself to mind wander, to get caught up in irrelevant, meaningless thoughts, right? I see a meaningless world um, because I have meaningless thoughts about the world. Right. I was also taking it like our mind is just, like life is a prayer in a way. Totally. So like the thoughts kind of distract us, but it's happening anyway. There's a prayer, an existing prayer happening. And that existing prayer happening is? Life. Life. In which is the gifts of God. Yeah. Not at all any of this nonsense, meaningless thoughts out of which I make a meaningless world that can't deliver on anything other than upset. You know, Christ, I'm doing it to myself. I mean, what a joke. Except I forgot to laugh. <laughs> I forgot to laugh at my own foolish thinking, you know. I need light. I need understanding. I need humility. I need presence to be able to realize, yeah, how's that going to work? For five minutes, all I want is the peace of God. Thank you, Father. And then I rage away about it. Then I go back into my raging mentality in the workplace. And when, I, when I'm, Brenda comes home and when... You know, I hear my neighbor playing piano or when I'm sitting <laughs> with the guitar in my hands. You know, I mean, if you want peace, you've got to be serious about wanting peace. And if you're serious about wanting peace, then you are simultaneously serious about having peace because wanting and having are one and the same. You always get what you want. Mm. I need to know. I always, I'm always getting the effect of the results of my own thinking. But I suppose there's a lot of times where you say you want something, yes. you don't actually want it. Oh, that's, it seems to be so. That seems to be the case. And isn't a want a thought, really, anyway? Isn't a want? Is a it's, it's a, a form thought. of thought. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. It's like so a I. It's a creation. Well, it's. It can reflect creation. It can be a creation. It can be imbued with the principle of creation. But, but it, in this world or in this mentality where I seem to be separate and apart, it can also seem to be reflective of the uncreative. Right, like what I mean. And that, what I mean by the uncreative is just nonsense. You know? Yes, totally. I'm just making my world of hurt. Like, I think I want that thing, but it's coming from the ego or wherever. It could be from anywhere, but it, it seems so real and, you know, like, I have to have that thing, I want it. But the truth is, it's just a thought. It's Yes, it. and that thought can and will distract me from God's thought for right. me, which is really the what only I thing I want. <laughs> yeah. Because that's where the goods are. Right. That's where the goodness of creation is. That's where the principle, the abstract principles of holy instant are. The gifts of God. They're not in Jeffrey's world. In Jeffrey's wanting. I have to learn that so that I can rise above Jeffrey wanting and get to what I want. Because my reality is not Jeffrey. Right. Right? 
Nothing wrong with Jeffrey, no offense to Jeffrey, but Jeffrey is an illusion. <laughs> Holy sonship in God is reality. Christ, one with Christ in God is my reality. So let that inform me, let that principle, that thought inform me rather, rather than me thinking I gotta want, I gotta plug something into the void. There is no void. Right? If I get out of the business of forcing my issue, then I realize I'm in the presence of holy creator creating. And I get very quiet. Which is what I need because out of that quietness comes true presence. Holy self. Informing me of what I am and who I am beyond my distractedness because I need help in my distractedness. Who and what can help me but myself, holy self. So again, all wanting, all out of need is all rooted in the sense of there's something wrong with me, guilt. With, and and because, because here he says, without guilt there is no scarcity. Guilt is the disclaimer, it's the disownership, it's the denial, the decision to ignore that which I am. And in favor of a biased opinion or two that I have, out of which I suffer miserably. Without guilt there is no scarcity. And the sinless, then, have no needs. And the sinless is what you are because God created you forever beyond sin, which is only error. You can't really err. Your reality is fixed in the mind of God. And it's wholly pure, it's wholly good, it's wholly innocent. It knows none of this stuff that I claim to know which is problematic and troublesome for me whenever I think I know it, right? Because it takes me right down into the density of that distorted sense of myself, not the truth. So at this level also comes that curious contradiction in terms, in terms known as praying for one's enemies. The, the contradiction lies not in actual words, but rather in the way in which they are usually interpreted. While you believe you have enemies, you have limited prayer to the laws of this world. And have also limited your ability to receive and to accept to the same narrow margins. And yet if you have enemies, you have need of prayer. And great need Two. So what does the phrase really mean to pray for, one, for my enemies? Pray for yourself. That you may not seek to imprison, imprison Christ in the form of an enemy you think you have. Because who else could that other be but Holy Son, Savior? Salvation come were I to see him, see you as you are, which I am here to do. That's my, it's, it's my honor and it's, my, it's a privilege, an honor and a privilege for me to do that. It's also, you know, perfectly consistent with my decision to have peace. I can't have one without the other. If I'm going to have peace, then I have to see the cause for peace. The cause for peace is the certainty and the knowledge and the experience that I'm in the presence, holy presence of holy self. God's Son. And that's your gift to me, which I receive wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly, and uh, without exception and without condition or exemption. I receive you fully because I would know that self that we share. So I'm not deceived in you even no matter what I may think you asked or said or thought. It doesn't matter. Those thoughts don't matter. The only thing that matters to me is the thought that you are as God created you. 
And that's what I'm here to be a witness to, because how else? What was that? Uh, I don't know. Oh, okay. I think right. it's windy outside. Okay. So, you know, that's what I want to get to, and I, I want to get to that now. I want to have that now, so then I need to have it now unconditionally, which means everywhere always. Mm -hmm. So in order for that, I can't be deceived by my thinking about you, which would only be a reflection of my thinking about myself. I need to be clear about who I am, what the truth is. So, what does the phrase really mean, praying for one's enemies? Pray for yourself that you may not seek to imprison Christ who is yourself. And thereby lose the recognition of your own identity, capital I, your own identity. Be traitor to no one, right? Because to betray the other is to betray myself. Be traitor to no one or you will be treacherous to yourself. It's all or nothing. Either Christ is or he isn't. I, I'll have him be as, as a holy presence right here, right now, in place of anything I may seem to have thought <laughs> previously. I'll let all that go, no matter what form it enters into my thinking. So be traitor to no one or you will be treacherous to yourself. You can't afford to have enemies because in reality you don't have any. And when you decide you do, you're blowing in the breeze of your own ill will, <laughs> your own distorted view. An enemy is the symbol of the imprisoned Christ. No one can imprison Christ, he who God created free. I only think I can imprison Christ. Mm -hmm. And in that... I lose, I imprison myself. I seem to, to momentarily overcome the will of the Father and not on my own freedom, my own reality. So an enemy is the symbol of an imprisoned Christ and who could he be except yourself? The prayer for enemies thus becomes a prayer for your own freedom. When you're praying for, for someone you consider to be an enemy, you're praying for your own freedom. Now it is no longer a contradiction in terms. It has become a statement of the unity of Christ and a recognition of his sinliness, every, sinlessness everywhere always. And now it has become holy, for it acknowledges the Son of God as he was created. That's all I need to do. I need to get out of what I think is into acknowledging, accepting, honoring, receiving what is, not what I think is. What is? This is amazing, right? It is amazing. Yes. Life is amazing. I mean, it's right here. The principle of infinite understanding is right here and it's ours to share. And we're all in on it. We can all gain that experience in the most practical form for this, for that we think we're in need of. And I don't know what, I don't make that possible. I don't have any idea what that even is. But I trust in the one who does, in the understanding that surpasses my understanding that I have infinite faith and acceptance of, out of which comes an answer. <laughs> Even if I don't understand what the answer is, and I never understand what the answer is. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. But I, I can feel the validity of it. I, I, I'm hearing it. I'm feeling it. I, I feel the merit and the weight of it, the truth of it. The, the strength of it, the meaning in it, I feel it. Mm -hmm. Even though my mind is raging away in attempting to distract me from it, you know, none of that matters. Because I've learned that none of that matters. So I don't have to be distressed by it or follow it or try to change it. I just it's like in the eye of the storm. 
you're staying in the eye of the storm? Well, in the recognition that the storm is an illusion. Yeah. And I am the peace that dispels all illusions. The, the, the love that shines away all fear. That casts, oh, casts, uh, the love that casts out the sins of the world, the fear of the world, you know. That's what you are. That's what I am this is. That's what's always here, awaiting only your acceptance, your recognition and acceptance. It will tell you everything you need to know if you get in the business of listening. Healing, waking up, enlightenment is fundamentally a listening art. Learning how to hear his hearness, who will use your vocabulary and your life experience as the perfect reference for the miracle of life, for remembering and recognizing and, and celebrating the miracle of life right here, right now. So that the circumstance that I think myself to be in becomes now a new foundation for a new experience, completely unlike anything I ever thought before. <laughs> and now it has become holy for the knowledge of the Son of God as he was created. Let it never be forgotten that prayer at any level is always for yourself. If you unite with anyone in prayer, which is really all we're doing now, even though we don't seem to be formally praying, clearly this is prayer. You know, what is prayer? It's we're, we're sharing an experience of communication using what we think we have to gain an experience beyond what we think we have, right? We're all being administered to, we're being given something we, that can help us no matter where we are, what we think ourselves to be in the midst of. It's prayer, it's communication, holy communion, you know? A new meaning, new understanding so that all this stuff that seems to be problematic and distracting to me from time to time can serve to be a window of infinite opportunity. It can now inform me in a beautiful and miraculous way, completely beyond what I think it is. You know. So let never be forgotten that prayer at any level is always for yourself. If you not unite with anyone in prayer, you make him part of you. You make them part of you. They already are part of you. It's important for me to know that, to have that experience of it. Um, the enemy is you, as is the Christ. Of the two, of the two only one is true. Your identity is, is as God created it. You are the Christ. There really is no enemy. That's really all learning converges there. You discover and learn there's nothing for, to forgive. It didn't happen. All of that crazy stuff I seem to think, I remember, has no reality. I am as God created me. Worries are over. So the enemy is you as is the Christ, and again of the two only one is true, I'm adding that. You do not choose for another, you can but choose for yourself. Pray truly for your enemies, for herein lies your own salvation, your own release from what you thought. Forgive them for your, for your sins, forgive them for your sins, for here, and you will be forgiven indeed. Because he is you. And all that wrongdoing that you think happened to you is a reflection, only a reflection, an echo of what you were doing to yourself. Prayer is a ladder reaching up to heaven. Getting there. Prayer, two more paragraphs. Prayer is a ladder reaching up to heaven. At the top, there is a transformation much like your own, much like the one we're sharing. You know, um, for prayer is part of you. The things of earth are left behind. Clearly, that's what's been happening. You came in talking about your house. When you came in, I had just spilled a package of 
stinky fish, cat food on my on my floor and kitchen on myself. I was all caught up in, you know, that's all completely, it's gone. All that stuff is, is gone now. You know, we're praying, we're climbing a ladder. We're, the ladder doesn't really exist. There's nowhere to climb from or to. But we're, we seem to be climbing a ladder. We seem to be raising our consciousness up to a condition or a state we call heaven. At the top, there is a transformation, much like the one we're sharing right now. For prayer is part of you. The things of earth are left behind. We've been doing that, yes? I mean, clearly, you came in thinking whatever you were thinking, a bit, you know, having to do with what you think happened, what getting here or earlier in the day. But clearly, we're in another, we're sharing another experience right now, which has nothing to do with any of that. It's beyond all of that. The things of earth are left behind. All unremembered. Effectively, you're using undoing, unremembering, as a means to heal, as a means to recover or return to infinite, true, holy instant. The things of earth are left behind, all unremembered. There is no asking. For there is no lack. Prayer, ultimately, that's what prayer brings, right? If you get beyond all that neediness, trying to get, trying to fix, and all the, it becomes celebratory. It becomes, holy shit. <laughs> you know, it, become, it becomes like, I'm holy. <laughs> you know, I'm holy. This is holy, you know, holy, holy, holy. <laughs> God is right here. Perfect love is right here. The blessing of life is infinitely right here, right now. Infinitely. Mm -hmm. There's no asking for there's no lack. Identity in Christ is fully recognized as set forever, which it is, because God's mind doesn't change. Beyond all change and incorruptible. The light no longer flickers or seems to flicker because the reality is the light never did flicker. There was never a time or place when you were not the light of the world. <laughs> the light no longer flickers and will never go out. Now without needs of any kind and clad forever in the pure sinlessness that is the gift of God to you. His son, prayer can again become what it was meant to be, a means of communion, communicating infinitely with the infinite, full remembrance, full wakefulness, total joy, being, being the beingness of perfect joy, God's happiness, sharing infinite happiness, a creator of infinite joy. For now it rises, prayer, for now prayer rises as a song of thanks to your Creator. Now, you, you know, it's just, thank you. <laughs> Sung without words. Or thoughts. Sung without thoughts. The pure communicative principle of holy communion in you it's in interactive celebratory exchange with Almighty God. Right here, right now. No matter what I think. Whether I think I'm capable of it or believe it or... That none of it matters. The truth of it is the only thing that matters. Um, And now it rises a song of thanks to your Creator, sung without words or thoughts, or vain desires, unneedful now of anything at all. <laughs> so it extends as it was meant to do, and for this giving, for this giving, God Himself gives thanks to you. Goal is the goal. God is the goal of every prayer. 
giving it timelessness instead of end. Nor has it a beginning because, you know, I mean, in, in your right mind, you couldn't even... The idea that prayer would have an ending makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> Why would you want perfect communication to ever end? Holy communion to ever end? You want to be in on that forever because you are in on it forever. <laughs> you might as well receive the bounty of it, the abundance of it, the, which is fundamentally a state of mindfulness, being mindful of it, awake to it present to it. So God is the goal of every prayer giving it timelessness instead of end. Nor has it a beginning. Right? Prayer has no beginning either. It's like you. Because the goal has never changed. Prayer in its earlier forms is an illusion. Because there is no need for a ladder to reach what one has never left. Yet prayer is part of forgiveness as long as forgiveness itself in illusion remains unattained or apparently unattained, if I perceive it's, it to be unattained. Prayer is tied up with learning until the goal of learning has been reached. And then all things will be transformed together and return, returned unblemished into the mind of God where it is. Being beyond learning, this state cannot be described. It's beyond words, beyond concepts, beyond a, lear a form of needing to learn it. The stages necessary to its attainment, however, need to be understood. Understood, that's different than conceptual learning. The stages necessary to its attainment, however, need to be understood if peace is to be restored to God's Son, who lives now with the illusion of death and the fear of God. And then it goes on. And if you want to read on during the week, you can. Uh, the, the next would be uh, Roman numeral 3, and that would be praying for others. It goes on. It's great. You know, it's... It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I'm, I'm really glad we're using it as a means to... Uh, um, right, we're right at 8.30. So everybody knows this is one of the supplemental pamphlets, right? You can access... Kevin, where did you access it from? Just, you can just look up Google Song of Prayer PDF. Great, right up. great. Song of just Prayer P, P, PDF, okay. Yeah, and the, and the, the other, other one is... Uh, psychotherapy... Yeah, and that one's up on there too. Yeah, yeah which is also powerfully and beautiful. That's a really, it's a really cool one for people who are like interested in, you know, the traditional analysis, what he has to say about it. It's very, and it, it's very interesting what he has to say about what it. What was that book called again? Psychotherapy, it's, Practice, and Something in Principle. If you, if you just look up uh, ACIM psychotherapy pamphlet, it'll come. come it'll come right up. Yeah. ACIM it's really, psychotherapy. Really, it's really brilliant. I mean, it's amazing how he. And of course, Helen and Bill were therapists. Yeah, yeah. And Bill wrote that, or. What's that? Who wrote this pamphlet That's on psychotherapy? Channel. That's channel. Yeah, it's all. Oh, it's it's all Holy okay. Spirit. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. It what they it's what they described as supplement supplements to the course. And uh, I've had them for years, read them for years, and just adore them. You know, they're, <laughs> they're enlightening. Yeah. That's it. So, you know, every thought I have, every type thought I seem to have can be a means for a different outcome if I give it to him. So that the question I think I need to ask are the are resolve I allow him to resolve it now that may not give me an answer it may not give me a, a typical form type answer that I can plug into my neediness right now but something will come of it if I just stay open to it if I just let it be as he would have it be and used in his way if I have a little patience then it 
trickles down into my experience in some personal way that I get it. And, and that might involve a, a conceptual thought or a conceptual answer or not, you know? For me, the, um, get, in terms of prayer or asking for an answer of something, one thing I definitely had to learn was to not press God for the answer. Yeah, yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah. because I have no faith. Yeah, so it's much better to just be like, just let me know, and then get quiet and go on with my day, and something will just—I'll just have an insight about something. And yes, it, it'll enter it in, in some way other than the way I think I need to get. Yeah, it, it definitely doesn't feel like like I figured it out. It's like, oh, thank you, you know. That's yeah, I mean, the idea of pressing God is so classically egotistical arrogance. Yeah, you know. Like, because it's, it's insisting that God hasn't answered me yet. Mm -hmm. When fundamental, fundamentally, all answers were given in the beginning. The answer is in what I am and who I am. Not getting a conceptual explanation for, some, for, for an, a question I can never really have. <laughs> that in my sense of myself as God created me, I don't have. So whenever I'm caught up in those aspects of doubtfulness, I've already wandered away from my sense of who I am, from the presence, the mindful, unconditional presence of the Christ in me. That's always here, and would always um, gently and firmly enter in if I don't make a case against his being here, that presence being here. It's a much easier way to go. Mm -hmm. And it sets everything at ease because it gets you out of that very rigid thinking that I don't have an answer, but I have a need and I need to get an answer, which is very anxiety ridden. You know, it's the idea, you know, of that just shocking to your system to your deeper sense of being at rest and at home. In the answer, who is God Almighty? <laughs> in which there are no questions. Once I was in a really, really, really dark place, and I went beyond, to, even beyond my own thinking in the darkness. I didn't even know where I went, but I knew I was going to commit suicide in about three days. And I never took a sleeping pill in my life. And I was thinking of take. I got a somehow. I, I got a vial of sleeping pills and aspirin. And but Goramai Shivalasana, she had sent me this tape. It was five minutes long, and it was it was a um, done in Sanskrit. And she gave me these two laminated cards, and I sang them every night, no matter what, no yeah. matter what was happening. I sang them, and it was the day before I was going to do this crazy thing. I, I don't know where I went. And, um, and I'm sitting there in the middle of doing it, and I hear a voice say, what you said before, ye of so little faith. <laughs> and I went, what? And I, I, I broke into, like, like, it felt like hot, hot, cold, freezing ice breaking through. Uh -huh. And I screamed again, what? And it said it again, ye of so little faith. And I go, oh my God, where was I? I didn't know where I was. Yeah, that's because you weren't anywhere. Yeah, I wasn't anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Although you were here all the while. Yeah. Right, because right, that self that is always at home, that unconditional presence of that which you are, which you share with God, is never absent, mm -hmm. is never not witnessing. The only question is, who, are, who am I being? What self am I being? What thought am I entering into? To who am I going for perceived need or help? You know. So you want to be clear about, you know, whether you're turning to the light or to your perceived darkness. The darkness will always deceive you. The light never will, because it will always honor and bless you. It will always remind you of what you are right now. That's always the answer to whatever the question seemed to be. 
know. So great. Thank well, thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you know, you thanks for a great evening and you know, good questions and good sharing and um, a lot of very mindful, attentive, attentive uh, presence, which is a gift. You know, it makes it makes uh, a wonderful possibility come alive. You know. Thanks again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Oh, sure. Sure. <laughs>